morning, everybody. This is October 20th, 2021. This is Keith uh, from my home office, and I wanted to say good morning. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful fall day. So was yesterday, and there's so much happening. I want to encourage you. I want to help you, and I want to remind you that God loves you and that he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We have nothing to fear. We have all all the future to claim, but we live in the midst of a crazy world, don't we? Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, church, of course, on Sunday is at 10 o'clock. Be there by probably quarter to 10 to get a seat and to be sure to be a part of that. We are currently preaching a series from Revelations 1, 1 through 3. Jesus's words to the church yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We see in Revelations 1 where Jesus reveals himself and we see a glimpse, a limited glimpse, limited by our humanity, limited by our language, limited by our circumstance and limited by our sin. But we see a glimpse of the wonder and the glory of Jesus and the rest of Revelations will show us wonders and the glories of heaven above in anticipation of what is to come. But Jesus writes the book of Revelation. Jesus conveys these words, his words, in Revelations 1 to 3 to John, that he would record them and share them with all the world, with the churches specifically in Asia Minor, but with the churches past and present and future. For there's words and power in the in, in, in the expression of the risen Jesus. In the Gospels, we see Jesus contained in his incarnate body, in his human form. But here in Revelations, we begin to get a glimpse, and it's only a glimpse, of what Jesus is truly like. Sixty years after his ascension here on earth uh, to heaven, it's time for him to give a booster shot, if you will. And he gives us a booster shot in the form of the book of Revelation. We see who Revelation was written to. Revelation was written to the churches yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jesus picks seven specific churches that people in that day, in that era, could relate to and pointed out strengths and weaknesses in each, then challenged them all to reboot, to repent, and to come back into the, the fold of, of their orthodoxy, the fold of their, of, of their roots, the fold of their family, the fold of their faith. We all need to be reminded from time to time who our true love is. We all need to be reminded and recommit and renew our faith and trust in the things that we believe in. We have so much to be thankful for. But Jesus reminds us that this world is not my home. I'm just the passing through. And part of his encouragement in Revelations 1, 2, and 3 is to encourage us to persevere, to carry on. For this world is not our home. It's a temporal place. It's a temporary assignment. But one day, all things will be made right and all things will be made new. But in the meantime, for those of us who are faith and have committed our faith and trust to God, we are on commission. We are on assignment to help bring the wonder and the glory of heaven to earth. Indeed, South Harbor Creek Church should be a a, a outpost, a heavenly outpost of God's presence here on earth. Are we? Are you? These words are meant to convict, and when we're convicted, we're convinced that we need to renew, repent, and recommit our faith and trust in God. And when we do that, we develop a new sense of possibility. I've got a couple things. Sorry for turning my back on you. Um, when I share with you Wednesdays, it's usually in the midst of sermon preparation and sermon thinking. 
Uh, I'm doing research, I'm doing reading, I'm praying, and I'm looking at scriptures that God leads me to, top, back and forth, and I'm trying to piece it all together so that by Thursday and Friday I can then try to communicate, try to communicate what uh, is happening, and try to communicate the truth. My machine is sending me a, a warning message. don't know what that means. I'll keep going. This week, see the first week we talked about the church in Ephesus. They had lost their first love. They had lost their love for God, love for one another, and love for those that are seeking and needing the love of Christ in their life. They had become inward and, and withdrawn, and they had lost their love. That's perhaps the overarching message that Jesus gives to the remaining six churches. The remaining six churches in Revelation 2 and 3 are uh, grouped, in my mind, in three groups. The first group is a group that is that is grown too tolerant of the world. As they've tried to live in the world, but not of the world. They have found themselves drifting into worldliness rather than godliness. And as they do that, they're going down a slippery slope that will take them away from the place of God's innermost being. And God might even actually need to expel them from the realm of the church, which is like the bride of Christ, Christ's very own. We do not want to be expelled. We do not want to run that slippery slope and go down. But Jesus picks the churches in Pergamon and Thyatira to be illustrative to be reminders, to relate to today and to think about tomorrow, but they tolerated too much sin. They tolerated too much of the world without keeping the Christian distinctives alive. Challenges us to think what is the Christian distinctive of the church. Thinking back to Revelation, it's love, or um, Ephesians, it's love, loving God, loving one another, and loving the world seeking to save those that are floundering, those that are needing, and those that are lost. I ask myself, does South Harbor Creek Church tolerate too much? Does South Harbor Creek Church really have a love for God, a love for others, and a love for the world and the community in which we live? We have much to be happy with and satisfied with. The church and God's blessings have been so great. But I question whether we've hit a plateau where we need to ask ourselves, are we tolerating too much? In Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus then addresses his message to two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that are under persecution. Their very lives at stake, they could be imprisoned, they're subjects of slander and, and discrimination of all kinds. And Jesus says, don't fight. Don't fight retaliation with retaliation. Rise above it, for you are children of God. You've got a future beyond this world. Hang in there. If you can tolerate the things of this world, the world that comes next is so, so extraordinary. And all things are right. And Jesus tries to encourage the churches of, of Smyrna and Philadelphia that they are far more significant than they think. They must carry on. So we look at this and we say, what's going to happen next? And then we see this week, the sermon we're going to preach regarding the churches of Sardis and Laodicea. So at first we had churches that tolerated too much, and then we had churches that were being persecuted. And this week we're going to look at Sardis and at Laodicea, churches that have grown complacent due to pride. And there's lots of reasons to have compl complacency and lethar lethar lethargy in life. But we are children of the light. Our faith is proved by works. We're saved by faith, but we're proved by works. Our works justify us and depend us. And we see in these churches that Sardis, who thinks it's alive, is truly spiritually dead. I think our churches are filled 
in America with people that are spiritually dead. I think South Harbor Creek Church has people that are spiritually dead. And while they show up and they smile and even give an offering and participate in certain events, they are spiritually cut off, hungry, and depleted. I also think that Laodicea was very filled with pride. They were called lukewarm, but they were self-sufficient. And we as Christians are never self-sufficient. We're dependent on one another. We're dependent upon God. And we need one another. And we need more than anything. We need Jesus. So Jesus addresses that in these passages. In the midst of his address to the church in, in Laodicea, there's a verse, Revelations 3.21, which is famous and well-known by many people. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he will eat with me or they will eat with me. Friends, Jesus stands at the door of our lives and our hearts. If you've grown complacent, it may be time for us to consider whether Jesus is truly a part of our life and our heart, our heart and our life. Is Jesus invited into our lives? And are we willing to invite him into our house, not just the living room, but into our daily living and our daily routines? I think of the image of, uh, of Munger who writes, and we'll be giving out little booklets to everybody on Sunday. So come on out Sunday. We want to see you. We want to give you a little booklet that's called My Heart, Christ's Home. And it postulates, and it's a parable. It thinks about what happens when we invite Jesus into our living room? Well, we don't want him to know about the poker, poker game that's happening down in the rec room in the back of the house. You see, we all of us need to be sanctified. We need to grow and become more and more like Christ. We see that in the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane in John 17. That John's answer to the challenge that we have living in a a, a non-Christian world, being in the world but not of the world, Jesus' prescription in John 17 is be sanctified, become more like Christ. We see in Revelation 2 and 3 that Jesus is addressing the church, saying, you have slipped, you have lost your place, you are falling behind. Renew, repent. Repent means to turn. Turn your heart to Jesus. Turn your heart from the past turn away from the past, and turn away to the future. And in that, we will find hope and purpose that's new and unique. I was visiting with a woman in our church this week, and she had the malaise and the lethargy, lethar lethargic feelings that so many of us have had during COVID. Complacency even. Not due to pride, but due to life. But how do we break out of that? We break out of that by remembering the past that's been good and anticipating a future which is even better. When we begin to imagine that, we begin to, 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 to stop being indwelled and gain the capacity to be outward. We also begin to serve. She and I talk in some of her happiest times as a Christian were times of service. You see, God honors service. Sue Fuller's teaching a class on Wednesday nights about outreach in the community, but all of us are well served when we serve others. Homo and curvitus in se is a, is a term that was coined in the early church about the church turned in on itself rather than opened and expanded to the world. Friends, we cannot be turned in ourselves. For Jesus was never turned in on himself, but turned out towards us and to the world. And for that, he left his heavenly throne room to come to earth, to encourage us, to help us, and to do what we could not do, overcome the power of sin and the power of death. And Revelation shows us glimpses of that, but Revelation is meant to be Jesus' word to the church. And after he gives that word, the rest of the book of Revelation is a series of visions that help apply God's love, God's encouragement, God's strength, God's grace, and God's wonder, God's victory. In every movement, we see that. And then we work towards the culmination of all time, according to the Bible. 
in Revelations 20 and 21. Friends, this is an exciting series. It's a good ser series. This week, we're going to start with, as the umbrella verse, Revelations 3, 21. Please look it up. You might want to read about the churches in Sardis and Laodicea, but particularly we're going to look at 321. It's depicted by a famous picture. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. There's no door on the outside. Jesus doesn't force himself into our lives or our houses, but we open the door and welcome him in. The prescription for complacency, due particularly to pride and self-sufficiency, is dependence on God, dependence on Jesus, a welcome of Jesus to become a part of our lives, our thinking, and our thoughts, that we might become like him. In addition, we're going to be looking at the wedding feast, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. We're going to look at and see the importance of being clothed properly. The church in Sardis had soiled their clothes. The church in Laodicea was dressed as though they were naked. But Jesus comes with his cloak of holiness and righteousness, robes of white, brilliant white, pure white, and wraps him around us that makes us a part of the wedding feast of the bride with his church and prepares us for the glory and the wonder of heaven. Are you clothed in the glory and the righteousness, the salvation and the life of Christ? In the wedding feast, we see the need of being wrapped in the kimono, in the robe of Jesus's righteousness where we cannot do what he did. So he needs to extend that love and grace, and he does to all who believe. But even more, we then look at James. In the book of James, chapter 2, we see a discussion, a discussion about whether you can be saved by faith alone. Yes, you can. Faith alone. For no man is saved by works, but they're saved by faith. But you know what? James teaches an important lesson. We see that lesson that our faith is shown in our works. What we believe shows up in our, in our actions. And the conclusion is, if you don't have actions that are validating your expressions of faith, do you really have faith at all? That leads to complacency, that leads to deadness, that leads to still water and stale water like Laodicea experienced in real life. Do you have stale water in your life? Or are you experiencing the fresh and refreshing coolness of God's Spirit rolling through like a, like a babbling brook through the, the innermost parts of your life? I've been there. I'm there sometimes. And I need to renew and refresh. Jesus' prescription to all seven churches is repent or turn so you can open the door of your life and then come under the, the blessing the nurturing, the love of Jesus the Christ. So I look forward to sharing more explicitly with more illustration and maybe more expression on Sunday. But our key verse will be Revelations 3.21. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And as we think about that, we think about a life of faith and we then turn our attentions to James 2 and we say, what does a, a life of faith look like? A life of faith is demarked. A life of faith is identified with the fruit of the Spirit. From the inside, love, joy, and peace. From the outside, fruitfulness and ministry and productivity. That the love of God is being spread near and far. So friends, I pray and I think that you'll be great. As you join with me in prayer, let's pray for Harriet Morris. She had some surgery earlier this week. She's doing very well at Hammond Hospital, hopefully being discharged before the weekend, but we're very encouraged and we're very grateful. I know there's others that have been in and out of the hospital. We want to be praying for them. We also have, and this is where I was supposed to be today, but I'm playing hooky. Over 20 of our people, or about 20 of our people, are on a bus going down to the Creation Museum, but more importantly to me, to the Ark Encounter today and tomorrow. And they're going to see a life-size replica depiction of what the Ark may have looked like back in the days of Noah, which would have been prehistory. 
It's a phenomenal structure. It's a huge structure, and it's supposed to ignite the imagination so people can see and imagine what it was like in the days of Noah. And in that, seeing the, the blessing and the protection and the provisions of God through all things, through the storms of your life, God will give you an ark that will see you through that storm that you might then be all that God wants you to be. God loves you. God cares for you. And I want to close with a verse. It just came to me. Let me see if I can find it. It's in an obscure Old Testament book called Hosea. Hosea 6.3. Let me read to you from Hosea 6.3 as our closing verse. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Do you acknowledge the Lord in your life? The churches in Sardis and Laodicea were not acknowledging God. They were acknowledging themselves and taking pride in their self-sufficiency. But the words of the prophet Hosea remind us that we need to acknowledge God in our lives. Let us press on to acknowledge him more. I pray that your life and I pray that our church acknowledges God and points the way to Jesus. And as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. Every day we can count on a sunrise to come. And as sure and certain as a daily sunrise, we know that Jesus will come. That's the point of Revelations. Is we're helping prepare the world for Jesus' coming again. Coming again. Coming again. Maybe more me. Maybe me. Maybe sometime so very soon coming again. Jesus is coming again. Let me finish Hosea 6.3. And as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Jesus will come. Friends, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is with us every day in dwelling in our house, in our, the house of our lives, the house of our heart. And we can open ourselves fully and completely to Jesus. I encourage you to do that. For behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. Will you open your lives to God? That your life might be refreshed and made new. Not stale, not lukewarm, not dead like in the church in Sardis, but babbling like a brook. Like in Getty, we sang on Sunday past as a deer panteth for the water. And we imagine what it would be like to be in the oasis of a Getty with a babbling brook and surrounded by shade trees and soft breezes in the midst of the Judean desert, unknown and unseen by most because it's in a valley and a crevice, but it gave G uh, David and his men relief. And so Jesus gives us relief today. Open your lives, open your hearts, and join us on Sunday. God bless you, God keep you, and I'm praying for you. Even more than that, God is loving you and holding you in the palm of his hand. In all these things I pray, amen.